to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham coming at you today nearly live from Gatineau, Quebec. We're at the Canadian Museum of History. And a couple of weeks ago, we posted the first part in our two-part series on the Celebrating Canada project. And we had Matthew Hayday, Robert Talbot, Marc-Andre Gagnon discussing the overarching purpose of that project and the nature of celebrations and commemorations in Canada. And now we're here at the museum where the workshop is taking place, and we're going to have on some of the participants in that workshop to discuss their contributions to that project and really the examination of celebrations in Canada and how these things are created, what their meaning is, and how these concepts are constructed and deconstructed. we got some really interesting stuff. There, there's a lot of great work going on as part of this project, and I personally am really excited to talk to these folks, although I don't know how excited they are to talk to me because we're doing this during the lunch period, so we're sort of taking them away uh, from their, their food to talk to me. So uh, hopefully everyone <laughs> is, is looking forward to this as much as I am. So here we go. First up, we have Lee Blanding, who is a sessional lecturer in interdisciplinary studies at Langara College in Vancouver. Uh, received his PhD from the University of Victoria studying Canadian multiculturalism policy. And you're here looking at how celebrations, commemorations, Expo, big example, and the Brussels exhibit in 1958 uh, are lenses into multiculturalism. So welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Very excited that you're here. So in part of this Celebrating Canada project, uh, you, again, you're looking at this multiculturalism aspect. How exactly are you going about this? Because something like Expo, obviously a big event, uh, how do you parse out the multiculturalism in the, an event that size? Well, I'm, I'm not so much interested in, in artifacts or material history. I'm more interested in the discursive aspects of it. How did bureaucrats choose to, to portray uh, what Canada was, uh, what it meant, and so, and in many cases, I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm, I have to go searching for, for these sorts of things because it's maybe now we take for granted that Canada was a, uh, is, is seen as a multicultural place or a, a, a diverse place, but that wasn't necessarily the case at the time. So in some ways, I'm trying to reconstruct it or, or find, find places where that is, is mentioned. But then when I do it, it, it's all the more interesting for it, the way that diversity gets portrayed or not portrayed at the time, and, and the, I, I, I'm interested in the discontinuities between uh, the sort of official line and then actually what's going on behind the scenes and mm. the, the degree to which multiculturalism is, well, it, I, my argument is the degree to which multiculturalism is not actually fulfilled, the, the, the promise that things like uh, the Centennial offers is not really fulfilled. Mm. But how do you go about showing that? Because so much of what people remember, at least, and, and if we look at the memory of it, is that it is this sort of unifying event. Mm -hmm. And granted, that memory has been constructed a lot by the official discourse that has been laid down. So how do you go in and try to challenge that, given how strong these memories can be? Yeah, I don't, I don't feel that I really can challenge the memories, but I, I, I think what I'm trying to show is that, that there's a, a real difference between I specifically, I'm looking at like how much money gets spent on things. There's a lot of money spent on things like language policy. There's a real strong emphasis on trying to uh, incorporate French Canada into into the narrative. And yes, d diversity gets mentioned, but is there a, is there any money long term for it? Not really. Uh, there does seem to be money long term for youth programs. And some of the other participants in this in this book project talk about how. Over the long term, there's money spent on these things, so there's a, in in a way a legacy, but not the case with multiculturalism. So it's not really until 1971, until the announcement of the the official policy, that we really see an infusion of cash. So yeah, I mean, you can you can put up all the pictures you want. I mean, there's a famous uh, there's a famous exhibit in the in the Canadian Pavilion, of sort of a, a mosaic of of people's faces. And that is maybe something that people remember, but it didn't really translate into uh, anything tangible uh, for ethnic minor uh, ethnocultural communities or for ethnic uh, minority communities. So th that's what I find very interesting. Could the counter to that not be then that, well, at least at Expo and other like events, at least people are talking in this way. 
and this idea maybe gets ingrained, and mm-hmm. then in the future, because these ideas have already started, then when it becomes official, uh, the reason it can become official is that people are already used to it. Yeah, I would I would say that's one of the the reasons um, that there isn't, to to my way of thinking, the reasons the reason one of the reasons there isn't a backlash against multiculturalism in seventy one, is because there's been a lead in period in which people ha- had time to get used to the idea. Earlier in the decade, if you, the, the, the dialogue was all about biculturalism, uh, and it took a little while for, certainly for government officials and for politicians to catch on to multiculturalism. I'd say by the end of the decade, many of those people still haven't changed their minds, but Canadians as a whole, I think, are starting to move in that direction. And, I mean, there are lots of things playing into this. There, I, I mean, it's it's kind of cliche, but the sort of spirit of the 60s is mm-hmm. more ecumenical. It's uh, Diversity really is, is important to the way that people are, are, are starting to view Canada. So, yeah, it, it may have planted the seed for, for people. And it, it meant that politicians really couldn't go go back towards a, a, a bicultural or even a British you know, a view of Canada as British. And they, they really have to move forward with the tide of history. Mm. Um, at least that's, that's, that's the way I see it. Mm. And do you feel, you know, I, I, I want to get back to this idea of the, the memory of these things being so strong. Mm. And how do you confront maybe someone who was at Expo who says, who, who I'm sure might say that you're wrong? <laughs> It's like, I was there, this is how it was, yeah. you're wrong. I mean, how do you confront that? Yeah, well, I mean, I think you have to distinguish between Expo and, and Centennial. I mean, Expo is mm. only part of what I'm dealing with. Sure. And, and Expo was the visual the visual side of things, the, 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 the thing that people often remember. Mm-hmm. But if you look at the Centennial celebrations as a whole, something like multiculturalism was only a very a, a small portion of that. There were travel programs for, for youth. There were all sorts of book projects, and, and then I mean there are the official things that were going on, and then all the unofficial things mm-hmm. as well, and, and provincial activities. There's just such a wide range of things. I'm interested in the aggregate, and in, and on the whole, I would say multiculturalism, while while it might have been visible in a way, didn't as I say said before, didn't translate into something tangible into funding into a real support of the, the the multicultural movement and there really was a movement it was very small uh, but these people were very vocal about their opposition to biculturalism their opposition to the royal commission on bilingualism mm-hmm. and biculturalism and did they get any support because of centennial no not really mm-hmm. they had to continue sort of doing things in their own way and in the end they were moderately successful in that Canada adopted a multiculturalism policy. So yeah, I understand that people were were there and they saw it, but that was just one aspect of a a much larger picture. Well, And it's a really interesting story, and and we'll look forward to seeing the chapter when this project comes out. Oh, so uh, do I. (laughs) (laughs) Let's leave landing from Langara College in Vancouver. Thanks so much for doing this. Thank you. And next up here we have Anne Trepanier from Carleton University at the Canadian Studies professor, the resident expert of Quebec down there in the Canadian Studies department at Carleton. And she studies national identity performances, and specifically what you're doing here is looking at the competition on the calendar for celebration. So, so specifically, what, is that, what does that mean? So I'm looking at the identity performances of many groups belonging to the larger Canadian identity. Mm -hmm. And on the last Monday of May, there's something very special happening on the symbolic calendar. Many would say they celebrate Victoria Day, which is actually a celebration that is not even uh, mentioned in uh, Great Britain, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a very Canadian-specific one. On that same day, French Canadians used to celebrate Dollar des Ormeaux, a marcher from New France, a very mythical uh, character whose um, affect was to represent New France uh, needs of colonization, but also evangelization, Christianization, Mm -hmm. and survivance. So it was a very important character in the mid-19th century until... A new group 
was uh, going to be represented on that same day by the Kovac government and uh, declared the national holiday. So the Québécois, since 2002, celebrate les Patriotes, and the Patriots were rebels, depending on the historiography you're looking at, right? So we're um, Patriots fighting for stronger autonomy from the British crown. And uh, there's also their roots of Quebec nationalism in some ways uh, that could be further discussed. Mm. But my goal here in this project is to show the competition of those three groups. And there's even a fourth group, the Aboriginals of Canada, wanted also to have one date to celebrate their uh, sense of belonging to Canada, but also their entitlement to be celebrated and they've chosen the same date. Mm -hmm. Uh, What's very interesting here is that it's at the crossroads of this day of May are conflicts, like true conflicts between groups. Mm -hmm. Uh, Let me explain. So Victoria, when she's 16, she's a young queen, and the first thing she does in terms of a political gesture is to um, knight Lord Durham. Lord Durham is also a legend, terrifying legend for French Canadians because he's the one who, just after those rebellions Mm -hmm. of 1837 or 1838, was sent by the British Crown to find a solution. Durham report. To the uh, Durham report, to the crisis. And one of his first comments was to say, well, French Canadians, they have no history nor culture, (laughs) and therefore (laughs) we should assimilate them and create the Canada of Union. So what's the reaction in Quebec? It's in French Canada. It's the beginning of a new historiography. And what (laughs) the character that that was uh, maybe founding this new myth was found in New France history in the person of Dollar des Ormeaux. So you see how this yeah. <laughs> this uh, speaks all this spe- speaks to each other in mm-hmm. terms of conflict. Of course, it's a symbolic conflict. If I ask you, what are you doing this weekend? And you say, well, for Victoria Day, I go to my cottage. Mm-hmm. And I say, well, oh, you are celebrating Victoria Day. Mm-hmm. I am going... Um, canoeing okay (laughs) and is that a cultural appropriation to go canoeing (laughs) on victoria day or is it more likely that i celebrate the patriot if i say so it it really shows that i belong to a specific generation of quebecois that grew off the quiet revolution like my parents could still say that they celebrate dollar Mm -hmm. dollar des ormeaux right because their identity is still shared mm-hmm. uh, with the, the other French Canadians in the rest of Canada. Right. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it used to be around that same time of year, late May, Empire Day as Yes, well. absolutely. Um, and, and so now we have Victoria Day and, and Patriots Day. And is, mm-hmm. Let's say specifically with the Patriots Day in Quebec, is that a decision by the Quebec government specifically designed to assert that place Quebec's place within confederation and say you know Victoria Day doesn't really speak to the Quebecois people to to how we view ourselves within confederation so we're going to put a holiday on the same day specifically to counter that narrative yes but it was explicitly that case Mm. earlier on with dollar right so French Canadians never celebrated Empire Day nor Victoria Day Mm -hmm. so the question is maybe threefold then the Quebecois did not recognize themselves anymore in the French Canadian Catholic mythology mm-hmm. and wanted to prove that they were modern and that their ancestors were also modern. Mm-hmm. So they took from the rebels patriots experience arguments, political arguments in the history of their group to show that their ancestors were modern. They wanted their separation of the church and the state. They wanted more autonomy. They wanted elected assembly. Mm -hmm. They wanted ministerial responsibility. And for the Quebecois of 2002, 
so after the last uh, referendum, it was um, a way to announce the modernity of the Quebec people. Mm-hmm. Not a press freedom province anymore. Right, right, right. And so I guess really the, the overarching message here, for those who didn't know, if you really want to be inclusive on that holiday, you have a busy day of stuff to celebrate. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be a lot to do. Uh, so, the best place to be is probably in Ottawa, where yeah. you can jump over the river, yep. uh, stop on the Victoria Island as well. Yeah. Yeah, just along the way, yeah, you could stop everywhere and have a full day and then go home and sleep for 13 hours. Because <laughs> you just, yeah. Anyways, you're in vacation. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's a long weekend, so yeah, so who cares? So we we'll look forward to seeing that in the book when it comes out, Celebrating Canada. Anne Trepanier from Carleton University, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And next up here we have Jillian Leach, who is a senior researcher for CDCI here in Ottawa. And she studies the way in which the British identified themselves as a sort of a larger British identity as well as the component identities within that. And we are recording this the day after the uh, referendum Referendum, in Scotland, uh, which was a very interesting Mm -hmm. event and I'm sure something that you, of course, followed very closely. Very closely, yes. Yes. But here, with specific reference to what you're doing here, you're looking at parades in Montreal and and how British identity was constructed through these parades, if if I may. Or demonstrated. I'm not sure that the parades constructed them necessarily, but I think they were constructed in Montreal society and and therefore shown to the society itself in the parades. Hmm. So who was putting on these parades? Most of the um, the National Day parades were put on by the societies themselves, so the St. Andrew Society, the St. Patrick Society, the St. George Society. They, they put on their own National Day parades mm. in the streets in Montreal. And did they have this notion of building an identity, or were they simply focused on, you know, let's have a party, this is a national day? I don't know that it's necessarily a party in their minds. I think mm-hmm. they were trying to commemorate the, their identity, try and show people that we are whatever we are, mm-hmm. and we're very proud of our, our identity oh. as mm-hmm. such, and that we, we are also here, and we're very proud to be here as right. part of mm-hmm. that identity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so it does go beyond the simple... This is our day. Let's celebrate. Yeah. There's there's this notion of we have to prove or sort of demonstrate who yeah, we are. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And and the parade is the most public aspect of their demonstration. Mm-hmm. I mean, the days themselves tend to be commemorated with a religious service, and usually in the early 19th century, a really good dinner okay. for the men only. Mm-hmm. So there's that as well. But that's more private. I mean, people will read about it in the newspapers the day after, but it's not quite the same as seeing a parade in the streets on the day. Mm. Was that sort of almost sort of lend the fact that this, something like that would be private, lend to this notion of, oh, this is a, a, a part of our identity. This is sort of this almost this exclusive club that people would want to be a part of and sort of express mm. that identity. Exclusivity is important, I think, mm. for the, the, the clubs, the societies themselves. Uh, they certainly uh, wanted to have this image of being, you know, very respectable. So if you're part of the society, you're part of this image of being respectable mm. and very almost posh because the St. Andrew Society and the St. George Society specifically, but St. Patrick's as well, they're, they're an elite in, right. in Montreal itself. But the parade is, is a way of including some of the other people who are not necessarily the elite, but who still share with them the same kind of identity origins anyway. Right. So. Right, like the type of people who would hang out at Joe Beef. Exactly, right. yeah. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of the people who are listening are familiar with Joe Beef in that article. Uh, if you've taken any, any course. Any history course, everyone's <laughs> read that article, yeah. yeah. But if you're not familiar, Joe Beef was a, a pub in Montreal yeah. that where sort of the working class... Caters to the working class. Yeah, yeah. And, and sort of Anglophone working mm-hmm. class as well. Uh, which actually leads me to a question on language. And, yeah. and uh, Montreal, probably the most Anglophone city in Quebec. In the period I'm looking at, it is really very Anglophone. Mm-hmm. It's The majority is English-speaking. Right. Yeah. But, of course, it is in Quebec. It's in and, Quebec. And, which is a Francophone province. Mm-hmm. And is there any notion of the linguistic tensions that exist in this country that are present in these parades? No. Oh. And the parades, I find this is their one moment where they're actually very inclusive. Okay. And um, especially in the 1840s and on when St. Jean Baptiste start parading as well, mm-hmm. you'll find that there's a lot of approval for their, their utilizing this method of, of, de- of identity demonstration. They, mm-hmm. They're actually very 
open to that kind of demonstration. Mm. They don't diss them in the newspapers. They're very pleased when they have their parades. And you don't see that in the French-Canadian newspapers because they're not writing about them at all. They don't right. pay attention, except for St. Patrick's Day. They do pay attention to those parades. But they, they approve the parades in principle, mm. especially St. Patrick's, because mm. it's also organized by the church in the 1840s and on. The church is far more involved in the the St. Patrick's Day Parade and the St. John Baptiste Parade, so there's that as well. Does that have anything to do with the routes that they're taking through the city as well? I mean, obviously, I would assume they're picking routes that are primarily through these neighborhoods. No. No. Actually, in the early part of the period, they're actually choosing the main streets of Montreal, so they're not picking ethnic neighborhoods. Okay. Not that there were really that many pockets of Scots or English. Mm -hmm. There's there's the Irish working class in Griffintown, but even then, there's still Irish elsewhere as well. They choose basically the main parts of like Notre Dame, and they, they're parading in there. So they'll parade from like their church, which is usually in the center of Montreal as mm -hmm. well, and they'll parade through the main streets. They'll parade by government offices, so they're they're essentially implanting themselves in the center of Montreal, not in neighborhoods per mm -hmm. se. So. Is that symbolic of sort of claiming that place? Yeah, it's it's yeah. claiming the, the space. This is Montreal. This is us. Mm -hmm. We belong here. Everyone can see us. It doesn't matter who you are. We are here. You know, over time, do these things grow and are they strengthened or do they start getting weakened by things like St. John Baptiste? And are, is there almost maybe too many of them? To have meaning. The parades do lose their, their appeal for the Scots and the English. They start, start limiting the size of their parades from uh, the main streets to basically from their offices to the church, and then that's it. Okay. Whereas St. Patrick gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and then there's more parades for St. Patrick because it starts getting organized on a parish level. So there's several parishes that have their own St. Patrick celebrations, and St. Jean-Baptiste does essentially the same thing, mm -hmm. does things on the parish level that that you'll never see with the Scots and the English. And then the Scots start thinking, well, you know, this parade stuff, it's kind of disruptive. And right. it's yeah. kind of, you know, there's a lot of hoi polloi around. We, we don't think we're going to do it. And they sort of just stop their parades in the 1890s. Okay. And the St. George do pr pretty much the same thing as well, oh, wow. although I can't tell you exactly when they stopped. Right. I haven't looked that one up yet. But mm -hmm. well, it's, it's an interesting story because, I mean, I go to parades sometimes, not yeah. often. And, but when I go, I'm all, I, I never really understand them. People are waving no. at me from the exactly. floor. Exactly, like, yeah. Well, what's going on? But it, it's interesting that there is such meaning to them and, and mm -hmm. historically at least exactly. so we look forward to seeing that chapter in Celebrating Canada once yes. it comes out uh, thank so you. Jillian Leach from CDCI Ottawa thank you so much for doing this thank you so next up we have a tandem group here a couple guys working together Joel Beliveau from Laurentian University studying uh, issues of collective memory national celebrations and identity and he's here with Marcel Martel from York University who studies minority rights, moral regulation, and his recent book is Canada the Good, A Short History of Vice Since 1500. Welcome to the podcast, gentlemen. Welcome. Uh, well, not welcome. <laughs> thank you. Hello, thank welcome you. to you. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I am. I'm coming to your event, really. So thank you for having me. So what uh, specifically are you guys working on here? Well, on probably the greatest celebration but I, I'm joking uh, <laughs> when I refer to Empire Day, but, uh, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not that far when I say greater celebration because something I've learned about Empire Day, well, of course, Empire Day, the idea uh, came out at the end of the 19th century, and it was, you know, a woman from Hamilton who felt that not much was done, you know, to, you know, to promote a sense of belong, you know, a sense of Canadian, uh, of, uh, Canadian identity, but also uh, the fact that this national identity is part of a uh, broader, you know, identity, which was, well, we are part of the empire, uh, the British Empire. But what is interesting, this started, you know, it was a Canadian idea that, you know, the rest of the empire, you know, in Australia, New Zealand, uh, South Africa, India, decided to do that. It started 1899, and then two or three years later, uh, the rest of the empire celebrated, you know, uh, uh, Empire Day. And that's the reason I said this <laughs> This is a great <laughs> thing, because often we feel like, well, we, we haven't made any significant contribution to the world. Well, I would say yes, we did with uh, Empire Day. Would you, you agree with that? that? Well, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of these uh, surprising uh, stories. You know, a, a day for the empire that's in, in, invented in Canada rapidly, rapidly spreads throughout the country and then is exported. And is uh, among the prop proponents, we have the king himself, who's right. you know, advising the few uh, dominions and colonies who haven't jumped on board yet to, to do so in 1903 or 1904. Right. 
And uh, what we're trying to look at is also how Dominion Day was perceived uh, from one end of the country to the other. Mm -hmm. We're kind of going for a, uh, a wide geographical range on one part and uh, uh, over the long term. We're looking 1899 to the 1950s mm -hmm. when it becomes a Commonwealth Day. Mm -hmm. how, how do French Canadians and English Canadians in Ontario or Anglophones out west react. Uh, right. you know, how are their reactions different, and so mm. on? How are natives portrayed in there? Are they portrayed at all? Actually, they're not at all. You know, they're, <laughs> they're completely ignored. There is a passing nod toward French Canadians. We also look at the press, you know, and how how it's celebrated. And uh, one of my surprises was to see that up until the conscription crisis mm -hmm. of 1917. You know, Empire Day is given a chance in French Canada, both mm. in Quebec and in other Francophone communities. You know, it's not celebrated as much as Saint Jean Baptiste Day or uh, Assomption in Acadia, but it's you know, it's, it's there, it's respected. The tone is positive, mm -hmm. and there's kind of a negotiation going on. You know, we're proud to be part of the empire, and we're proud to you know to mark it. But you know, what does empire mean? I, I, you know, if empire becomes too this or too that or too British, if, if you're, you're imposing uh, the English language as a, uh, as a condition to be part of the empire, then we're not interested anymore. So we're right. kind of participating but negotiating, mm. saying, you know, we're in for now. Right. And after the contribution crisis, that is completely over. Mm. Yeah. And it's true that in 2014, because I'm sure when people will listen to us, they'll say, oh my goodness, they must be in their late 80s, they <laughs> probably have no gray hair, and they are nostalgic <laughs> of the British Empire, which is it's exactly the way uh, this is a fair assessment of who we are. <laughs> uh, but to, to be serious for, for 30 seconds, what is interesting about uh, Empire Day, first of all, uh, it started in around 1899, and it lasted in Ontario uh, until 1958, and then it became, you know, uh, Commonwealth Day. But what makes, you know, the study of Empire Day relevant today, it all started with, you know, this, uh, besides, you know, the fact that you had this uh, individual in Hamilton, you know, wondering, oh, my goodness, what can we do to promote, you know, uh, a sense of belonging, which is, even today, we often, you'll have some people who will say, uh, you know, wh what brings us together as Canadians. But there is another aspect that makes, again, uh, this project quite relevant. There was a general concern about the lack of knowledge related right, to, to history. And often those people would look and say nothing is done in high schools and primary schools in, in Ontario, in the rest of the country, when it comes to teaching, you know, Canadian history. And guess what? In 2014, we are having, you know, a similar uh, discussion. You know, why should we study history? Even some people would say, is it relevant in studying, you know, history? I would prefer, you know, to study, I don't know, transnationalism, etc. Well, we have this debate in 2014. Well, in 1899, we had, you know, a similar uh, debate. And this uh, woman who forced, this is what is remarkable again, you know, she decided, she wrote to the Minister of Education in Ontario, Minister of Education was looking at a way to promote, you know, the study of Canadian history in classrooms, and he thought, wow, she, she, she has an interesting idea. Then some would say, well, she was lucky, maybe she was lucky, but she was also quite, uh, you know, she believed in, in the virtue of her project. But here we are again, uh, fundamental question, why should we study history? Is it relevant to study history? We ask this question now, and that was the case in 1899. Right, hmm. right. It also talks to the quest of uh, Canadians for uh, an identity, a national identity of yeah. sorts, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, in the volumes we're preparing, there's going to be an entry by uh, Matthew Hayday well, where readers will see that Canada Day and Dominion Day were you know, not a big deal at all in the first half of the 20th century. And some might be led to think that, oh, patriotism or nationalism didn't really exist in Canada. Well, no, it did. It just took on a different form and uh, with different symbols. So yeah. that's what we're exploring here. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'll be interested to look at, at this particular chapter as well because for me, you know, studying radio, the Empire Day celebration that I'm really familiar with is 1939 yeah. when the king and queen are there in Winnipeg. So for me, and obviously there's very clear symbolism what's going on in 1939 with the king and queen there. So uh, I'll be interested to see sort of the larger trend of Empire Day through the years, and uh, I would love to talk about this more, but Matthew Hayday is, is, uh, has started to hover. He's beckoning, so, beckoning yeah, us. Yeah, so you yes. have to go back to the workshop and continue uh, 
to participate. So, Joel Bellivo and Marcel Martel, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for having thank us. Thank you. Thank you. And next up here, we have Peter Stevens. He is, teaches in the Canadian Studies Program at York University, research on leisure, recreation, and tourism. And specifically here, you're looking at Thanksgiving and the history of Thanksgiving, which is a really interesting subject. So, first of all, thank you for doing this. Thanks for having me. When did Thanksgiving start in Canada? Well, in the Canadian context, uh, Thanksgiving began as an official holiday in 1859 was the first one. So in the provinces of Canada? Yeah, the United Provinces of yeah. Canada at the time. And spearheading all of this were Protestant clergymen in what is now Ontario. And they'd looked to the American model of Thanksgiving, which had been celebrated sort of off and on and in different parts of the United States, but was sort of getting consolidated around the same time period. And they looked to that and they saw in the holiday uh, an opportunity because there's a couple things going on around this time period. One is there's a lot of talk uh, about the idea of Canada coming together with Confederation. So that's one thing. And the other thing that was going on at the same time period is that Christianity was under attack in a lot of ways. This is the time period you've got Darwin uh, releasing his, uh, his famous works. You've got a crisis of faith, as some scholars have called it. So what the clergymen are looking for is an opportunity to first of all have an opportunity to help Canadians understand who they are as a people and this is mm -hmm. of course becomes a bigger issue after confederation but they're also looking for a way to sort of shore up their own authority as sort of cultural figures within this context in which you've got Darwinian science coming through and also um, new biblical criticism that is increasingly um, raising doubts uh, amongst Christians so how do you shore up the faith how do you turn people into good Canadians? Mm. Which is interesting because right now, I don't think many people would look at Thanksgiving as a religious holiday. Mm. At least, I mean, I don't. And, and I don't know if churches even do Thanksgiving services on Mondays. I mean, some might. So how has that sort of evolution happened, and why has that founding principle sort of faded from the holiday, do you think? Yeah, well, I think that's one of the things that I found that was so fascinating about it originally is that, well, first of all, this strong uh, religious uh, element to it, but also a strong nationalist element mm. to it, which you certainly see in the American context, but I don't think in Canada we think of it as a particularly nationalist holiday. But what happened over time is that, you know, it was a big day for uh, people going to church originally. Uh, what was interesting is that the sermons these guys would give uh, weren't typical sermons. They were far more nationalistic far more in keeping uh, or paying attention to current political events as well. Mm. The problem was is that, first of all, this was a very Protestant holiday. And over time, what happened is, is that, first of all, Catholics started saying, hey, wait a minute, what about us? Right. Um, and the other thing is, is that it was a very uh, a kind of nationalism very much connected to um, connections to empire. Uh, so a strong emphasis on British connections. But what you start having is other... Uh, people from other immigrant groups that aren't feeling that same connection. Um, you've also got working people who f rarely get a day off work. Mm -hmm. uh, the last thing they want to do on the rare day off is go to church. Right. Uh, so increasingly you've got, uh, you've got workers that are uh, using uh, the, the opportunity to go to commercial amusements and things like that. You've got the military eventually coming in and holding these sort of sham battles, <laughs> uh, military displays. And you've got other sort of public events, uh, pubs hosting turkey shooting competitions and all this kind of stuff. So increasingly over time then, uh, there's a lot more to do on Thanksgiving Day than simply go to church. Mm -hmm. There's all these other things you can, you can do as well. Mm -hmm. So over time then, the, basically the clergymen sort of lose control over, mm -hmm. over the holiday. And you've got other, other interest groups, the military, business interests, and mm -hmm. so on, who end up having uh, more say over how, how, it, how it goes. Would you say that the holiday becomes Americanized? Because when you look at sort of the major symbols of what Thanksgiving is, there, it's indistinguishable between the two countries at this point. You know, turkeys, pumpkin pies, bounties of whatever in the middle of the table, uh, going around the table saying what you're thankful for. I mean, the, the, these things are interchangeable at this point. To some extent, but in the American context, you've got a lot of emphasis on the, the Puritans and stuff like that. Right. Uh, and that's, that is so cl such a decidedly American element that it, it can't be really incorporated into the Canadian one. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I think is interesting about the initial um, celebration of Thanksgiving Day in the Canadian context is that, on the one hand, it was a day that was really devoted to celebrating the connection with the British Empire, and yet the day itself was borrowed from 
America. So it's this right. really interesting mix that I think really illustrates the place of Canada as mm-hmm. this country in between both uh, the United States and, and Great Britain. Whether it Americanized over time, I suppose you could say that. Eventually, we did start having turkey dinners and playing football and all that other kind of yeah. stuff as well. But, you know, it, it gets more complicated in, in later dates, and, and, you know, that's conversation for another day, I suppose. But. Yeah. And, and so the last thing that I'll ask, is there, in this idea of a national holiday, is there a linguistic tension going on? Yeah, from what I've seen so far, uh, this was a very much, because of this emphasis on the British Empire, it's not something that was of any particular interest to, to mm. Francophones. And uh, certainly initially this was an Ontario-focused thing. It eventually became national. But you know, look at the, the, pa- the papers in Quebec, and, and there'll be a little you know, two-sentence thing saying, oh, yes, and, and over in Ontario they celebrated this thing they call Thanksgiving Day. Right. Right? So <laughs> it was not something that, uh, that I think appeal, uh, appealed to, uh, to Francophones and French mm-hmm. Canadians in, in the same way it did to people of British background. Hmm. And with Thanksgiving coming up, as we're recording this about three weeks away or whatever it is, it's it's timely, at least our conversation. When people are listening to this, Thanksgiving might be three weeks in the past. But hey, at least right now for us, it's very timely. So Peter Stevens from York University, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. All right, and next up here, we have Christina Ogden. She is a writer and a traveler from Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, She has a background in art history and looks at public art and architecture in urban spaces, and specifically here, what you're working on is uh, a study of the 2005 centennial celebrations in Alberta. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you. And of course, I am obliged to note, as someone who is very much biased towards Saskatchewan, that there were also centennial celebrations in Saskatchewan in 2005. But uh, you're looking specifically at Alberta. So exactly what aspect of those celebrations are you looking at? Well, the origins of my uh, essay or project was to look at some of the events surrounding the the, uh, centennial and I was looking for projects that maybe didn't fit in quite with, with the sort of the usual events. Uh, I mean, you had, you had parades and you had you know, picnics, um, capital projects, of course. Uh, but I started to notice maybe a few other events that I, I don't want to say didn't fit in, but they seemed a little bit unique mm. to the uh, to the centennial. One of the uh, events that I I started noting and. Was, um, became quite in, intrigued by was the a large scale cultural arts festival that uh, was hosted by the National Arts Center in the same year. wasn't necessarily uh, originally tied to the centennial, but happened to occur in in uh, 2005, and that was the Alberta scene. Mm-hmm. So that was part of the National Arts Center's uh, larger series yep. that brought artists, performers uh, to the Capital Region where they were on exhibit and performed for uh, two weeks or something. And so the same thing happened in Alberta. So you had a very large scale um, festival during Alberta's centennial that actually didn't occur in the province, which I found uh, quite interesting. Mm -hmm. And those scenes, they've, they've con- I don't know if that was the first one they did at the National Arts Center. Second, I think. And they've continued yeah. it. I know we did a week with the Northern scene, which was a couple years right. ago, or sort of 18 months ago now, and I believe the next one is Ontario scene. Right. Uh, and they did, the only one that sort of, I think, bothered some folks is that they did Prairie scene, which lumped Saskatchewan uh, and Manitoba yes. together. But I think that's a good idea to have do Alberta during that centennial year, and it makes sense. And did that event, the fact that it was in Ottawa, did that get a lot of attention in Alberta? I'm not sure it got as much attention as perhaps uh, it could have. Mm-hmm. Um, you do hear a, a little bit, or you, when, once you start uh, reading articles from the main newspapers, that perhaps there should have been a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Uh, at least that was the perception at the time by certain uh, cultural writers in the area. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure that it had the same kind of mm-hmm. same kind of um, attention that, that yeah. I mean, overall, though, was there a sense in 2005 in Alberta that this was a a major event, or was the stuff sort of, I mean, yeah, okay, you have this thing in Ottawa, I'm sure you had a bunch of stuff in Edmonton, but otherwise, was it a a big deal to people out there? I I don't know yet. I'm 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 still trying to, I'm still trying to figure that out, because I think that's an important, important point. Um, I certainly noticed that in terms of uh, particular writers at the time, that, uh, writing for newspapers and that, that, that maybe uh, it could have been given 
a bit more that it could have been um, seen as a, a more important part, but that's still, mm. you know, I think it's under debate, and I'd have to right. take a look at it a right. bit more, yeah. Right. And, I mean, that's a time, if I remember right, mm. that in 2005, Alberta is still very much a uh, very strong province economically. Obviously, there's been yeah. issues since then. How much does that tie in, that, that Alberta might be at that point the strongest province in the country, uh, economically speaking, and that maybe, you know, th- this country has a reputation of you don't want to sort of be over-congratulatory. <laughs> so you have this major event at a time where the province is doing well, and maybe there's this sense of, well, maybe we'll downplay it a little bit, or there's not this need to celebrate because everything is going pretty well in the province. Well, I'm, I'm wondering a little bit when I'm, when I'm writing this, when I'm thinking about this, yeah. whether or not we're looking at... It certainly seemed to me that it sort of did launch my work, anyway, into sort of a broader discussion about sort of how Alberta viewed itself at the time. And I'm talking about the centennial in in general. For sure, But, uh, like, all the events are sort of tied to it. And also, I don't know if I want to say how Alberta maybe aspired to be viewed outside. Um, But there seems to be this kind of interesting sort of almost fluidity between how um, you have certain people who were in this in this festival that's held in Ottawa that weren't necessarily Alberta-born, uh, but maybe were in Alberta for a short time. And there seems to be this, this um, fluidity in terms of even attaching the scene to the centennial mm. events as it, as it occurred. I think there's, there's this kind of... It, it's not so regimented in that. Right. It's, it's almost like maybe there's not even that much cohesion between everything. It, it's sort of happening... But it's not necessarily a coordinated effort between various groups, or that, that's at least the sense I'm getting from you. I don't want to. I don't want to say that that wasn't the case because I think at, at some point you do start to see a little bit yeah. of that. But I mean, for example, um, when when it was announced that they were going to do a scene for Alberta in in Ottawa, according to some of the newspaper reports, it wasn't stated that that was that it was even planned. Like mm. it just happened that it's you know that year and and oh right. here we go here's the here's the centennial so that link was made right um, so, so it's almost like what a great coincidence yeah so, yeah, yeah. It, but in, and then afterwards you start to see a much more sort of mm. concerted effort mm. it would seem and certainly a lot of, of writers at the time are are making those connections mm. so yeah okay I think that's and then just. With reference to the scene, I mean, what types of acts are they getting? Who are they bringing in? And is there anything that can be drawn out of the lineup? Because obviously there are choices that the National Arts Center is going to be making. And from what I know about the scenes, uh, at least the two that I have been marginally involved with, uh, the first one very marginally involved with, and the second one I, was, I got a little more access to sort of how things work, but it seems as though they base those decisions purely artistically or at least in the case of the two that I was. I mean, whoever the best performers were, whether it was visual arts, music, storytelling, whatever it was, we're bringing in what we have determined to be the best artists. Is it a similar thing in Alberta, or are they trying to be maybe more representative or say something larger about the province because it is in the context of a centennial? I think it might, with what you were saying before, um, I think that, yeah, you do have a a variety. You uh, you notice the... um, where the artists are coming from. There were a lot of uh, different genres represented, a lot of different kinds of performers mm-hmm. represented. So I think, in, in a sense, uh, one of the, um, one of the uh, events within the scene that I'm looking at for this, for this paper uh, focuses on an opera that mm-hmm. was um, called Philomena that is um, looking at a story of a, an Italian immigrant in the, in the late, I think it was like early 20th century, she ends up caught up in, uh, in um, uh, sort of trafficking uh, booze at the time. And then she ends up, well, she's in the Crow's Nest Pass, so you're, you have that kind of part of the province represented. And then she ends up uh, being arrested because uh, um, there is a policeman who's killed. And, and the, you know, the, the, the gang's kind of involved with this. And so she ends up being the last woman hanged. Okay. In Alberta, and she's and this happens in Fort Saskatchewan, which is just northeast of Edmonton. So you have this kind of uh, connections to different parts of the province. Mm. Uh, so I think, yeah, I think in a way it was looking for quality, looking for mm. um, maybe representation from different areas, different mm. genres. So yeah. yeah, I think that's yeah, because obviously if it's going to be Alberta scene, you can't have 
ninety percent of it be from Edmonton, right, or right. Calgary or wherever, right? right? You need yeah. people from yeah. all over yeah. Red Deer and Lethbridge and right. way up in the north part of the province. I mean, you need to be representative. Yeah. So I mean, obviously, you want to be discriminating for the best talent. Yes. But it needs to be somewhat representative of the whole province. The whole province. So. Yeah, that's right. In terms of the stuff you're looking at, in terms of the, the sources, what, what's sort of the methodology here? Are you trying to find performers? Are you talking to folks at the National Arts Center? I don't know how much of the stuff might have been recorded from the scene. Obviously, the, whatever visual art they had, I'm sure you could still find and look at. I don't know if any of the performances would have been recorded or if any of those performers, musicians would probably still be performing, but if there's plays or stuff, if those things would still be performed, I don't know. But So, so exactly what is that methodology uh, and going about trying to find these sorts of things? I started out um, looking at newspaper reports at the time, and that's basically where I'm at right now, mm-hmm. uh, sort of going through um, the, the major um, newspapers in, in Calgary and Edmonton for the most part. And from there, I, I, uh, there is a website that still exists of the scene, so you have oh, okay. uh, everything listed. Yep. Um, and uh, also have looked at archives, um, but what's interesting, of course, is that I, I kind of I want to uh, take a look at sort of how these performers, t- seeing how they uh, sort of the effects that that hmm. scene had, um, which means, of course, eventually having to talk to. Sure. But that, I haven't gotten to that point right. yet. Like so it helped still... launch somebody. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Gave them greater exposure. Exactly. Led to bigger, maybe more airplay yeah. and yeah, radio exactly. stations yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that's really interesting. And, and so I mean. And again, for me, there's a very minor personal connection to the scene thing. So this is really interesting. So I look forward to sort of seeing the final product when, you, you. when this <laughs> thing comes out in a couple of years. So Christina Ogden, a writer-traveler from Edmonton, and we were just saying before, one of the few people who studies history who's not affiliated with the university, so that, who's been on the show. So it's, it's very exciting that uh, you're here and that you're uh, part of this project. I'm, I'm so glad that you were able to be on the show. So thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thank you. So there you have it. Six different projects, but all falling under this umbrella of celebration, commemoration. So my thanks to Lee Blanding, Anne Trepanier, Jillian Leach, Joelle Beliveau, Marcel Martel, Peter Stevens, and Christina Ogden. If you have any questions, comments for the podcast, historyslam.gmail.com, Twitter, at Dr. Shawnee Fever. And as always, if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.